Good morning, church. We are um, working on getting our new audiovisual set up set up properly, so that things happen like you know me being in focus. Although I think I look better when I'm not in focus, like last week. But until then, we're going to go with the uh, old-fashioned setup. The video quality is not quite as nice, but uh, it makes things like focusing a little easier until we get things set up. Today is the first Sunday of Advent, and Advent is that season of the Christian calendar that is about waiting. And um, if there's ever been a year that illustrates the need for Advent, it is 2020, a year when so many things that have happened that are just far bigger than us, far bigger than our ability to control and to deal with on our own terms. And so we enter into this season of waiting with a reminder, um, just very quickly, that uh, Advent is like going to the gym. The Christian calendar is like going to the gym. We are in this season exercising spiritual muscles that um, we will not only use during the season of Advent, but will be used throughout all of life. That is the point of working out to make life easier. And so we are those who live in between the times, like Israel, which is the part of the story that we focus on during Advent, awaiting the coming faithfulness of God. We are those who live between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ, the making of the promise, the beginning of the kingdom, and the fulfillment of the promise, the fulfillment of the kingdom in its uh, finality. And so we are those who um, have been called to faithfully anticipate God's promises and God's faithfulness. And Advent reminds us that to do that, we have to be intentional about it. I want to um, begin our first week of Advent in 2020 in the book of Job. Of course, you're all familiar with the book of Job. Job is uh, that great epic poem of the Old Testament. Scholars will debate about whether or not it really happened. It is valuable to us either way. Job is a righteous man, and he finds himself in a situation where a variety of tragedies befall him. Everything that is important to him has been taken away. Because Satan is convinced that in the opening chapters of Job, if um, all of these things are taken away. Job will simply curse God and die. And so Job is in a situation where his children have been taken away, where his wealth has been taken away, where everything that he holds important has been taken away. He has reached the point to where even his wife encourages him to go curse God and die, to kind of give up on the project. And Job, yet through all of that, remains faithful. And so at the beginning of Job, when everything is taken away, Job goes to the town dump, to the trash heap. He sits down in sackcloth and ashes, and he begins to mourn. He begins to lament. He begins to try to, try to puzzle out what is going on. And our text this morning in Job 17 is uh, one of those moments of lament as Job works things out with his three friends. And I want to take time just to read Job 17 this morning. Job, who's lost nearly everything, says, My spirit is broken. My days extinguish the grave mine. Surely mockers are with me, and my eye looks on their rebellion. Take my guarantee. Who else is willing to make an agreement? You've closed their mind to insight. Therefore, you won't be exalted. He announces or denounces his friends for gain and his Children's eyes fell. He makes me a popular proverb. I'm like spit in people's faces. My eye is weak from grief. My limbs like a shadow, all of them. Those who do right, the right thing are amazed at this. The guiltless become troubled about the godless. The innocent clings to his way. The one whose, whose hands are clean grows stronger. But you can bring all of them again, and I won't find a wise one among you. My days have passed, my goals are destroyed, my heart's desires. They turn night into day. Light is near because of the darkness. If I hope for the underworld as my dwelling, lay out my bed in darkness. I've called corruption my father, the worm my mother and sister. Where then is my hope? My hope, who can see it? Will they go down with me to the underworld? Will we descend together to the dust? 
And so in Job 17, we have in the midst of Job's grief and Job's lament this um, honestly very dark piece of poetry where he talks about his hopelessness. That line just before the question he poses at the end, I've called corruption my father and the worm my mother and sister. These are uh, terms for death. And then he asks at the end this question that oftentimes we jump straight to and we're tempted to take it out of context, which is precisely what I don't want to do today. He says, where then is my hope? My hope, who can see it? In the midst of all of the storms, in the midst of all that is going on, in the midst of all of the darkness, in the midst of everything that has gone wrong and everything that has taken away from, been taken away from me, in the midst of all of my grief and my suffering, where is my hope in the midst of this darkness? Who can see my hope in the midst of this darkness? And we, as the good church-going people we are, want to answer back to Job, your hope is in God. Your hope is ultimately from our vantage point in Christ. Don't give up hope. Hold on hope. Your hope is there. But as good church-going people, what we might oftentimes miss and what I think we need to focus on in this season of Advent is that in the text, Job asks the question, but the text refuses to answer the question. Job asks, where is my hope in the midst of this darkness? Who can see my hope in the midst of my suffering? But the text can offer no answer for Job. No glimmer of light can point to no hope. Now, of course, later on, it will. If we turn enough pages, if we go far enough, given enough time, hope will make its appearance and things will find some form of resolution, though if we're being honest in the book of Job, not a resolution that we are typically happy with. But in this moment, at this point in Job's life, the text offers no resolution. And on this first Sunday of Advent in 2020, this year where everything seems to have gone wrong, where plagues have descended upon us, where economic collapse has affected many people, where political uncertainty has uh, caused anxiety for many and real life ramifications for many more, where societal issues have reared their head to the detriment of many, where many of us have lost loved ones, where many of us have found ourselves unemployed. This list of darkness goes on and on and on. In a year like this, I think we need to acknowledge the great gift that Job 17 gives us, that it is okay, that there are moments where there are times where the darkness surrounds us so thoroughly that we can just simply say things are bad. We can just simply say it hurts. We can just simply say I don't see a way out of here. And Job 17 gives us permission to say this precisely without rushing in with some sentiment or some pat doctrine or some theological, theological treatise just after that. We are, Job 17 says, allowed to say things are bad and things hurt and this is bigger than me and I am mourning and this is not good without then turning around and saying immediately, but this too shall pass without immediately saying, well, we all know that God has a plan, without immediately offering some word to try to resolve the tension presented to us by a world in its darkness. It's okay simply just to say, I wish it wasn't this way, to wonder where one's hope is in a moment like Job's to wonder if anyone has seen hope in a moment like Job's. It is not unspiritual and you are not unrighteous and there is nothing sinful about finding oneself in the midst of that darkness. And here the church wants to be very careful because our tendency, our temptation is often to rush in with the opposite of that. To offer that pat word of encouragement, to offer that sentiment, to offer that comfortable doctrine, to offer that well-worn theological treatise on this is why things are the way they are. This is why the world works the way that it works. But we want to remember that in the story of Job, Job's friends, 
which we haven't mentioned yet, but Job is sitting here with three friends who have come from afar to be comforters to him in his grief. They are the ones that are offering packed theological summaries. They are the ones offering well-worn doctrines. They are the ones offering sentimental explanations to Job about why things are the way they are. They are the ones in the story who would say, well, Job, your hope is, your hope can be found here, and they are in the story of Job, the ones who are wrong. Job in the darkness, acknowledging the darkness, the brokenness, calling out in his suffering. His moment of hopelessness is the one who is considered righteous. And it is precisely in their answering Job's concerns that they fail to see Job. That they fail to, to hear Job, that they fail to acknowledge Job as he actually is in the moment. They are so concerned with upholding the veracity, the truth of their doctrine. Confirming their view of the way the world works, that they completely miss their friend sitting in front of them. They are so interested in saying, well, we live in a world where theologically speaking, God punishes those who are evil and God rewards those who are good. And therefore, Job, you must have done something wrong that they refuse to hear Job when he says that he has done nothing wrong to deserve this. That he is struggling in the darkness precisely because of his righteousness. They fail to see their brother, they fell to love their neighbor in the midst of the darkness as he cries out in hopelessness because they are so intent on answering the hopelessness. And the temptation here is a real temptation. And the tragedy here is a real tragedy because we are Christians. We are the ones who claim to follow, to live out in our lives the character and the nature of the God who hears people like Job. But our temptation is to not hear people like Job, to resolve the tension as quickly as we can. And so Job 17 gives us a pause on two fronts. On the one side, we want to be dedicated to hearing people in the midst of their darkness of not rushing in with easy answers, but rather standing by their side as a representative of the God who, even though he may not be seen in the darkness, is still in the darkness. I still remember in 2017, the first winter I had experienced in a long time, we lived in South Georgia for years. And then we lived in South Texas for years, and they don't have winter in South Georgia and South Texas. Every year in South Georgia at Christmas, they would take this vacant lot, they would rent a snow machine, and they would fill the lot with snow so children could experience snow. 2017 was my first winter back. I went an entire winter without ever getting warm. Of going to work when the sun was down, of coming home when the sun was down, of everything in my life uh, being up for grabs. And the challenge of God's presence was real in the winter of 2017. And I loved the sun. When the sun was shining, it was easy to praise God. I remember when spring started to finally encroach and Saturdays would roll around, I would walk out in the sun for hours just enjoying the presence of God. It's easy to know where God is in the sun, but then there were those sleepless nights. Those nights where I would get up and I would walk around my neighborhood in the wee hours of the morning or the late hours of the evening because I couldn't sit still any longer and I would cry out to God, where are you? And it was much harder to find God. It was much harder to find hope, to figure out what God is doing, to come to any sort of answer in the midst of that darkness. But the words of St. Patrick's prayer, the deer's breath, the breastplate, came back to me one night as I was walking. And in a part of that passage, what Patrick is doing is he's drawing all of creation in as a witness, all of history in as a witness to the presence of God. And he talks about how we rise in the strength of the radiance of the sun. And I remember thinking, yeah, it's easy to rise in strength, the radiance of the sun as a sign of God's presence. But then 
at the end of that, he talks about how not only the radiance of the sun, but the earth beneath our feet is a sign of God's presence. And there, as I walked around the neighborhood in the dark, I realized that the ground beneath my feet cried out to the presence of God. God is with us in the darkness. And God would not have us be in the darkness, but there is nothing sinful about finding ourselves in the darkness up against the brokenness of the world. And we must be committed to joining God, and walking beside those who find themselves in the darkness when they feel no hope without dismissing their pain for the sake of being right without minimizing their circumstance for the sake of having answers, but simply to be there because that is where God is. And so Job 17, in all of its darkness and all of the uncomfortableness that it provides, is a great gift to the church in times like this. Because our normal mode of operation is sing and be happy. Our normal mode of operation is how are you doing? I am too blessed to be depressed. Our normal mode of operation is everything is fine. And so we are going to sing upbeat, happy, clappy songs. Songs of which there is nothing wrong. But then we find ourselves in moments like 2020. Where it becomes increasingly hard to sing praise. Where it becomes increasingly hard to say everything is fine where it becomes increasingly a discipline to say I am blessed because it sometimes doesn't feel that way we find ourselves in the midst of the darkness we find ourselves facing things that are bigger than us when Job 17 says it's okay just to acknowledge that And it's okay just to sit with that. And it's okay not to rush to answers in the midst of that. And it's okay to wait on God in that. Knowing that he's there with you. And so the first week of Advent is about waiting in the darkness. And it isn't just a handy sermon topic. The darkness is very real. And the need to wait is very real. And we are the ones who sit with God in the darkness. Let's pray. I'm going to pray with you, and then I'm going to ask you to pray for, or I'm going to pray for you, and then I'm going to ask you to pray with me. And then we will remember who we are. Lord, this has been a hard year. And we come to this season with great anticipation because we know that we need to learn to wait on you, to exercise those muscles. God, we know that you will be faithful. Give us the patience. Give us the courage to live our lives in anticipation of your faithfulness. We come together and we pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we've forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. We shall love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. This is the first and greatest commandment, and a second commandment is like it. We shall love our neighbor as ourselves. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. We love because God first loved us. Anyone who says that they love God but hates their brother or sister is a liar. How are you going to love God whom you have never seen if you don't love your brother or sister who is right in front of you? So this is the command we have from him. Those who love God must also love their brothers and sisters. Church, have a good week. We love you and we miss you and we can't wait to see you again.